Yeah. Why don't I let you guys discuss together where you're at at this point, and then we could recap what we had discussed in our previous meeting. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Alex? It's <laughs> like, <laughs> it's on me. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, we discussed, um, I mean, we went through so many um, uh, parts and concepts and um, um, debates on different subjects. So, but uh, I guess uh, I can sum it up uh, to uh, being uh, very kind of focused on um, kind of few topics like um, language or uh, mediums, like as proposal for words, um, media, um, mediums as language or um, or um, new mediums such as uh, internet, um, playing with internet algorithms or um, or um, pure cinema or um, yeah, but we, we, we went through many places, so it's uh, difficult to uh, synthesize now everything in, in two, three minutes, but um, I, um, yeah, we, even with, uh, yeah, we, we, we were attached to Fluxus and we, yeah, we did an experimentation actually with one Fluxus uh, score, which Sydney started and, and then I, I, um, I responded to it and, um, and then there was um, discussions around um, currency and uh, what can currency mean in today's um, world, um, subtle currency, data capitalism, all these sort of things, the permanent interaction that we are kind of faced with. Um, um, and at some point we arrived at the idea that um, it's as artists, as conceptual artists, uh, both of us, Sydney and myself, um, uh, we, you know, everything leads up to some sort of form. So what would that form would be in, in you know, at the end of the day, after all these discussions. And uh, there is always this danger, I may say, that uh, nothing is satisfying, uh, that nothing can, nothing holds uh, properly uh, uh, what, the, what the mind uh, comes up with. So then this is also something that I personally encounter in my work, this kind of duality that um, there is one aspect of the thinking and I guess to some degree I um, kind of inserted into, into the discussion with Sydney, this kind of problematic of thinking something conceptually and then uh, another problem would, would, would have been, would be the, the actual material, materialization of the work. Um, yes, and Sydney, do continue if you, if you <laughs> feel like adding something. Have a good week. <laughs> yeah um just to like go a bit further like back uh we started thinking about like this idea so we yeah it came from this idea about like, thinking about language and like the way that it functions as a container and so we originally like um I found this clip I've been fascinated with for a few years of like keeping up with the Kardashians and like um Kanye West plays this game he calls a board game like b-o-r-e-d um, and they go through uh, Webster's dictionary, like pocket dictionary, and they say the words are positive or negative. And this happened like um, in social, like, um, you know, it's like on social media, but also like in like, yeah, it's viral, um, it's on TV. Um, so they're defining words as positive or negative and thinking about like barter, or, like basic. And so I think doing that in a public way really establishes, um, you know, kind of like a, a hierarchy or quality associated with these words or like the ability for the words to change. So we kind of took that, um, we found on Amazon actually, because we both needed to have a copy. Um, so I guess that goes back to the generic um, a little bit. So we went on Amazon and we found like the first four pages of um, the dictionary and we kind of did the same process and then put it through like different algorithms to decide on the word acquit, uh, which is really funny because like the relationship to um, Kardashians. Um, and that was a word that had to do with the flexus. Yeah. 
Um, and so thinking about the stability of that word or what that word means and investigating that. And I actually have up our drive of um, our responses kind of that happened uh, when we started thinking about a quit. So like, this is a piece I made a response to like Fruit Sonata. Um, you know, and like the way this functions is like you're on your phone and you screenshot and it gives you a, um, a selection, you know, so just thinking about that, the original one I think is like play baseball with um, a banana or something like that. Uh, so just that was my response. And then Alex screenshotted it and he responded and his response was this. Let me know if you can't hear it, please. The important thing is to move yeah. in the direction the best that you can. The important thing is to move in the direction the best that you can. Remember, move to the best of your ability. 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 So there's that. And then the last one we kind of have in here um, is this that you found, right? Like this is a found piece. Uh, right. So we have this mixture of like found, I guess everything's kind of a found object in a way. Um, but yeah, definitely this idea, sorry, of like absurdity and, um, you know, uh, tools extraction, I think is definitely something we have uh, leaned towards a lot in our in our practice so far and yeah now it's the form place and the I, this idea of like the objects um and like this idea of like a text or like a vessel or language being a vessel and that being in, like inhabited or how that can like change also was really interesting we found out the word acquit um kind of uh used to be used a lot is not used as frequently um and there's like an inverse relationship in terms of um forgot the specifics, but just the way that language functions and when it's used versus what it's not. And uh, oh yeah, the archaic meaning of uh, a quid is different than like its current usage. And this idea of like, you used to be able to like discharge your own debt or like take responsibility. And now it's like an outside force. Uh, so like interior, exterior conversations as well. Yeah. Oh, well, it's good to see those. Um, so, so you have some, would you consider those prototypes kind of? You were trying to figure that out, right? Yeah. Um. <laughs> well, you're both working in the form of video, right? You're both working in case kind of, and also appropriation, you know, de tournament and, um, and the generic, the generic container, like appropriating a generic, um, yours is kind of like a rebus, uh, Sydney, mm -hmm. like a game, while Alex is more like a, a presentation uh, it's more like, uh, you know, like a like a video piece. Um, and, you know, just to recap, because we had a long conversation before this, uh, what we talked about was aspects of non-standardized non -standardized language derived from the Webster's Dictionary via... Uh, chance operations, randomized operations, using the algorithm against itself to arrive at something that's more of a, having more of a subjective uh, meaning based on your, your mutual uh, associations that you're bringing to that. And um, I, made, I made the comments that uh, there are aspects of Exhaustion, which is a word that was important to you, uh, in I think it was in your initial meeting. I'm not sure, but uh, and that how our relation to the generic container as an exhausted one might not necessarily be negative, but it might be a starting point for uh, potentiality. Uh, now I sound very abstract, but. Um, Seems like our, our earlier discussion was more organic, but um, <clears throat> so yeah. So and also like object-oriented ontology. How does the object inform? How does the the literal uh, limit uh, the object limit uh, embodied object have a relationship to the the uh, digital 
platforms? How does language operate as kind of an artifact, kind of a ruin or a relic of, uh, I, think, I think you call them error poems, Alex? Sort of, yeah, sort of like that. Yeah, it was referred directly to the 404 uh, error that you encounter on the internet. So, and the messages that um, are attached to the this error, yeah. Which I guess uh, is very much, has very much to do with what you, what you were saying about the algorithms going back, going against themselves or being kind of, um, um, driving as a driving force to something else. You know, there's a great book on this topic um, that you may or may not want to be interested in getting. Uh, it's called, uh, there's another very important French philosopher called, uh, well, to me anyway, uh, called Francois Laruelle. And he has this whole uh, idea of a non standard philosophy. And, and he comes out of a, a, philosophy, a French philosophy, a continental philosophical, philosophical background of interest in the generic. And there's a great book, not by him, but it's an interpretive book because sometimes his text can be kind of, uh, Lara Wells' text can be kind of uh, hard to get through. But the, the, um, the philosopher, theorist Alex Galloway, Alexander Galloway, who teaches at NYU. He wrote a fantastic book called Laruelle Against the Digital. Mm -hmm. And this, the reason why I'm bringing up Galloway and this book is because he has a very determined relation to the digital and it, it's, it's not positive. He acknowledges all the positive aspects of it, but he has kind of a negative relationship he has an apprehension of the digital, you know, subsuming uh, our subjectivity via the algorithm. And he, he, he posits in this book about Laruelle that uh, it might be a way out. It might be a way out because the specificity, algorithms function with like, you know, specific information and the generic can kind of confound it I mean, one, one thing, you know, one, one generic operation that I've done in the past is I've taken a, I've taken a section of like a famous painting and I looked, I looked it up on Google images. And if you take a, a small enough section, it genericizes the response. So if I, you know, if I take a section from like a Manet painting, the Dijonur sur la Herbe or something, it comes up with all these responses of uh, bushes. You know, that has nothing to do with the original um, input, you know. So the thought process is that they're, you know, they're, they're instigated by this Manet painting. They move towards the generic un, un, uh, unconsciously via the algorithm. But I think what Laruelle and, and Galloway are talking about the generic is conscious, like a conscious application of the generic against uh, the specificity of digital algorithms. And that, that seems to cleave somewhat with, you know, uh, the term acquit, you know, because there's, there's kind of a, and, and your term, Alex, too, of unroot. Uh, and, and, and Bartleby the Scrivener's refusal to participate in the copying or the copyist's task, or just being in a, uh, a mute instrument in the copyists, the algorithm, al algorithmic projection. <clears throat> so these are some of the things we talked about before. I just wanted to kind of recap those a little bit. Uh, the other Im important uh, philosophers were uh, Giorgio Agamben, who wrote a great essay about the Bartleby uh, story, and uh, Jacques Rancière, who um, in, in his uh, kind of groundbreaking book called Mute Speech, he talks about the generic container. He talks about the novel as a generic container, uh, the novel form as a generic container. Uh, but he extrapolates that from 
he extrapolates from that that the viewer or the participant enters into a generic container or um, say like um, like genre painting, you know, like there, there's a there's a more immediate access into a genre painting than there is into a historical painting from like the 19th century, because everybody can relate to like, you know, a bowl of fruit, but not everybody can relate to like Napoleon's, you know, downfall at Waterloo. So he makes this, uh, Rossier in, in mute speech makes some very interesting arguments for the generic container, not as like a negative thing, but as a positive thing that it's, it's a way to access the, um, circumvent the specificity of the histor historical events. So like, if you think of historical paintings as algorithmic, you know, delivering like this kind of like, you know, this kind of programmatic um, narrative or pro programmatic idealism and, and the, um, the still life just kind of relating to like, you know, the present. That's a kind of a good analogy to, I think, to think about how one might have a stance in relation to the mediator. Uh, I mean, another artist that comes to, to mind is uh, Corey Archangel. Are you familiar with his work? But, you know, he, he just, he hacks programs. So, uh, again, you know, I'm going to return to the question that I, I brought before we started recording is that maybe you should make a decision or a non-decision about your stance in regard to that, or you could just leave it open-ended. Um, Sorry, stance in regard to? Uh, what might be considered like the subsumption of human ontology or subjective ontology by the, by the algorithm. I mean, we have our own games. We can make up our own games. They're, they're nascent algorithms, I guess, because and they're, they're based on a randomized thing uh, like, like you guys already did. Uh, I, yeah, I guess my question is like, you know, like kind of like uh, Hedo Sterile, I think kind of taking a kind of Marxist political stance somewhat with regards to the, you know, the new subjectivity in the digital. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, I don't know, there's this idea of like um, a more connected internet, like Web3, um, which I don't think really exists yet, but it's a work in progress. But um, this idea of like using, yeah, artificial intelligence to like benefit in a different way or this like decentralized internet, you know, um, where like you exist, it's this idea of extraction and I keep coming back to where, you know, like you exist in this way and this platform or like, you know, you have like this interest and like this niche interest and like you can combine, like you don't have to be everything everywhere. Like this idea of like omnipresence, um, you know, um, yeah, that's interesting. But also, yeah, this idea of like what an algorithm like currently, like currently our algorithms define as like human versus like, uh, yeah, like subjectivity and like everything. Um, so you mentioned the term extraction uh, quite a bit. And I, I think that's a fascinating term. I mean, if we just go back to the history of modernism and the idea of like the picture interrogating the viewer, you know, that kind of old cliche. Uh, but to some degree, there is this aspect of the subject is, is being mined, right? And uh, there's an ecology of extraction, which one can either participate in willingly or most of the times probably participates unwillingly. Um, again, so this gets back to the idea of like, you know, what's one's stance in regards to un un unwilling uh, participation in an ex uh, extraction. Uh, yeah, that's the bad faith part, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know, you know, I, like it's, it, I don't want to come down like on one moral side or the other. 
I have my own personal ideas about that. You know, like I know that if I spend too much time like online, uh, my, my literal body gets uncoordinated, you know? So there's, there's, there's actually, uh, there's, there, there are actually impacts of, you know, spending a lot of time online. We get re rewired, our minds get rewired and our body stops, stops, starts to lose its somatic memory. And, um, the implications, you know, are staggering, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't really have anything to say to that. I was just thinking, yeah. But I think- Let me just go back to the idea of play, too. I mean, like, we're artists. And, you know, invoking fluxus is, is an idea of play, you know? Free play. See what happens. Um, but maybe like informed with all of the, these ideas, maybe all of these, these ideas are the point of exhaustion. Yeah, I was thinking like incorporating those pieces that we showed you, those, um, our drive, like, and thinking about that in terms of like these objects that we're making. And also I'm potentially interested in like sound, um, but also like, you know, in like these texts and like having that just be influenced and that be kind of like the, you know, attached, but like also like maybe like very deep in there. Um, but also this idea I think about like uh, when you're talking about like uh, Rancière, I think about Duchamp too and like um, the uh, art coefficient, um, you know, in that relationship and like how things are placed differently throughout time. And also time, I think, is something that we have to think about a lot too. Um, in terms of like endurance. And I know earlier in conversations, Alex, you were talking about, this might've been the first conversation we had about exhaustion, um, about how when you do a performance uh, and you have like a score, like you don't say a score, you call it a something else. Um, but you know, this idea of like following it very strictly the first time, and then you get to like the fourth time and you're like more free through the constraints. And we were talking about like Hito in relation to that, like lovely Andrea and uh, everything so yeah the yeah. idea of sound is interesting because that brings in another sense you know it's not just the scopic I mean, a lot of what's online is like it's scopic right it's 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 you know scopophilia it's 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 flat it's visual uh it's a visual language most of what we're you know imbibing it so um using other um, senses, I think, is one way to kind of circumvent that scopic regime. And, you know, this goes back to like Marshall McLuhan. McLuhan would talk about how when you watch TV, you're like physically being kind of like uh, engaged. It's not just like passive, you're actively being engaged. So this goes back to your idea of extraction. We are actively being engaged bodily by the media, by the medium. And um, I guess, you know, by, by invoking different senses, we can, we can make that more of a, a, a round kind of experience and, or, or acknowledge it, you know, acknowledge that this is a phenomenological interaction that's going on. It's not just, um, you know, information flashing by, but our body is reacting to it. Yeah, um, also Mel Chen did a piece uh, on Melrose Place for like three seasons, like a conceptual art project and like the background of Melrose Place. And that definitely ties into that idea of like uh, phenomenology and, you know, like, um, you know, because we are picking up on all those things, we're just not like seeing it right away, you know? And uh, I also think about like Harun Faroqi in terms of that. Um, Harun Faroqi, like the, um, forgot what the name of he is like a, it's fire or something like that um I'll look it up but you know this idea of like things being seen like all these like phenomenal phenomenal uh, phenomenological um occurrences happening that we don't like directly acknowledge but they still are happening and influencing like our subconscious in the way that we process so yeah I think like sound I've been thinking about um I don't know, we could have like different aspects, um, but I like this idea of like all these different embodiments um, that aren't may not be physically present, but are still there, 
yeah, you know, or visible to the eye. Both, right, or potentially, right? Um, I mean, music is very powerful as a vibration, right? And and even spoken word in a certain way, if it's spoken in a spoken word is sound, right? Uh, so. Um, yeah, and so the, the you know the opposite of extraction is kind of insertion, right? Like you're talking about Mel Chin, and I was just recently reading um, Mel Bachner's book about his uh, essays, which is fantastic on this whole subject. And he and Robert Smithson very early on like did this project where they inserted an art piece into a, an art magazine, and it was it was just made from appropriated text and. Um, it was a complete fiction that they just inserted into this art magazine, thinking that that was the art object. Like they didn't have to make a literal art object. It was like, you know, early conceptual art. So it's similar to what you're talking about with Mel Chin. Like if, if, if one inserts oneself into that slipstream, one is actively, uh, you know, responding to extraction, right? Um, so you got your work cut out for you. I do love these props, though. I, I, I love this idea of the prop and the insubstantial sculpture. Or the ins insubstantial embodiment only made in thinking about how it's going to be used in the digital environment. Because that, you know, that brings up volume, like, you know, like that chair that you've made has volume as does our bodies, but does it have, is it sustainable volume, right? You know, if we want to talk about sustainability, I'm less interested in the idea of sustainability the way it's typically used like in a liberal politics than I am in terms of the resilience of the body uh, as sustainable in, the, in our specific conversation anyway. So when, when I think of those props, I think of them as insubstantial and as unsustainable, but then they get sustained within the digital, you know, uh, in digital perpetuity. So, so there's your time element. Yeah, like they could not exist physically at a point, but they still are like documented and existing. Yeah, yes. That's what you were talking about with Constance de Jong, uh, like the documentation becomes uh, the piece. Mm -hmm. So do you think that your form is gonna take like uh, a digital uh, or multimedia form? Okay. I'm, 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 I'm really looking forward to seeing the results, you know? But maybe uh, this would be a question to you. How, how would you, uh, yeah, how how are you kind of ad, ad, um, approaching, or how do you approach the notion of exhaustion in your work, or, or or how do you make it present, or is this something that is just conceptually in your head, or is or are you actually physically working with exhaustion as as an actor would do? Because actors quite do a lot of uh, this part of their technique to to free themselves of the of the mechanic and mechanical movements and all this sort of stuff and that kind of it's it's removed from them uh to some degree by being tired they're right. tired you know they, what i mean yeah so i can i can answer that very specifically um but i'd like preface it with this great quote by uh william kentridge so william kentridge started out in theater and then he tried something else and then he tried something else but he his quote is, I was reduced to being an artist. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm 62 and I've gone through a lot of different phases in my career and changes. And uh, in the last decade, a little bit over a decade, I've been painting paintings like these, which, uh, there, you know, there's an aspect of, art historical reference in terms of say like Malievich and like, you know, like a minimalist heritage, <clears throat> but kind of like in bad faith, they're kind of bad faith paintings. They're not idealistic in any way. Um, 
they're bad faith in the sense that they're not going for a, a holistic reference, but they're they're kind of exhausted abstractions in my mind. They're exhausted abstractions, so they're they're rather inadequate, like in terms of their uh, existential uh, vibe. So I'm interested in how I, how far I can push that inadequacy. So I could show you, I, I mean, I could show you a couple more here. It's like, so this, this painting here, uh, I forget what it's called. I, but some of the titles are, are telling too. Uh, this painting is, oh, oh, so this painting is actually, this, this painting in the back is called Arrive Exhausted. So when I title my pieces, there's a poetry to them. Uh, this painting is, uh, yeah, forgetting the, I'm forgetting the titles. Uh, but I derive my titles uh, in an aleatory way from uh, contemporary language. So items and checkout. So items and checkout is something you, you, you know, encounter in, in Amazon, right? But I'm also interested in the poetic, poetic double entendre of like my paintings being items in checkout. They're checked out, you know what I mean? So there's a, there's a very strong uh, ludic, playful aspect to, but also very serious aspect to the exhaustion, the exhausted abstractions that I'm involved in. The irony is that, you know, it takes a lot of work to make an exhausted abstraction, so. But again, I think it's powered by, um, my work has always been powered, all, all the different permutations of my work has always been powered by uh, con a conceptual uh, approach. Uh, recently, it's led to kind of more aesthetic approach. So like Arrive Exhausted, that painting behind me was very difficult to, um, to organize harmonically, like the colors. It's it's a very it's a very Kafka esque uh, endeavor actually because I I work to make these you know these very generic forms in a random way intentionally which is already paradoxical and then you know when I choose the colors sometimes I'm choosing them subjectively in terms of subjective memory but then when I put them you know into this generic container they lose their subjective memory and. Uh, so I'm like really aware of this constant game between like intention and uh, inevitable, you know, in order to make these objects inevitable, I have to accept the inevitable failures of reaching my goal. <clears throat> you know, so it's, it's related to Beckett, it's related to uh, exhaustion, it's related to absurdity, but, you know, Beckett's a great example of somebody who made a very rich language out of, like, exhausting the lexicon, you know. Of course, he brought this kind of Irish thing to it, too. But uh, so there's an aspect of humor in my work, too. I, I, I like humor as a subversive force. I kind of I picked that up very early on from Robert Smithson's writings which are very funny. <laughs> and, you know, when I read them, I read them in undergrad and I was like, what the hell's going on here? And I, I kept on rereading them and I finally got it. I was like, this guy's like, he's just doing a piss take on like art theory, you know? And I'm like, yes, I can do that for the rest of my life. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you think humor and exhaustion are very much tied together or it's, they should be? Well, for me, it's a way for me to, uh, reconcile, you know, the implications of exhaustion, especially as I get older, you know? Yeah. You have to have a kind of humorous distance to the whole idea of exhaustion in order to make the work work, you know? If I intentionally try to make exhausted images, like they won't be engaging. It's like if you try to write a book about boredom, it better not be boring, you know, because no one will read it. Yeah. But so like really great to meet you guys. I, I love you guys. I love the way you think. I'm I'm like right in there with you. And I'm really psyched about 
what are you going to come up with? 